or oh, 100 years ago. I mean, remember that? You know, there were times where women aren't allowed to vote. There were times when black yeah. people weren't allowed to vote. Yeah. So democracy today has evolved. Why shouldn't uh, interpretations of Islam evolve? But, but isn't that the heart of the problem of, of Islam in a lot? How literal yeah. the, the Holy Quran is interpreted? And I mean, viewers will, will all have a, a view on this. But I mean, are you saying that that issue, that crux issue is sort of being resolved in somehow in well, some I see, way? I, again if you go back to polls the majorities of, of Muslims do not have an issue in fact in even in Europe the, the biggest fear was not that Islamists are against democracy the biggest fear was democracy will bring Islamists so that was acknowledged in the West itself and that's that's so there was never really sure, a contradiction <laughs> there's never except maybe some ultra right-wing uh, media yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think also we've got to be careful that the argument people like Ben Ali and Mubarak used for the past 40 years to keep their regimes in power is that you couldn't have open elections because you had to stop these Islamists coming sure. to power and imposing their way what the events in Tunisia and then in Egypt proved that the argument that human rights were not for Arab or Muslim countries was a lie because what people were saying on the streets of Tunisia and Cairo was basically respect, freedom to make decisions, to have a certain governance over your own life, are common human values and are compatible with belief. And I think that's what we've got to keep in mind. And if I just may add one, one point on secularism. Secularism does not translate well in the Arab world mm. because it always means oppressing people. Oppressing. Whereas in, the, in most countries, like in Britain, it means the protection of, of the freedom to worship, the protection of minorities. This doesn't translate the same mm. way in Arabic. No, it's a very interesting point. I mean, um, uh, uh, Dr. Elefendi, I mean, you've been listening to that. I mean, do you think that that argument over the nature <laughs> of democracy and being faithful, in other words, having your legal and jurisprudence rooted in fiqh, in, 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 in holy law, has that kind of um, circle been squared, if you excuse the metaphor? Uh, well, I, I think the, the issue about uh, the interpretation of democracy or its um, uh, applicability and the, the way you say, I'm trying to protect democracy by preventing its enemies, at the same time, uh, making it less inclusive. Uh, I think that has uh, the system has has now been. Uh, this argument has been transcended in what we see. The, the the one 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 vote one time argument that was raised in countries like Algeria. You mean? Yes, I, I think that the the barbarism of the regime, hmm. which uh, make this argument, has been actually itself an argument against what they are doing. What, what they, they say. Their, their, their refutation was in their action. The, the regime of Bin Ali has been so barbaric uh, and, 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 and so uh, cavalier about human rights. The regime in Algeria has murdered 100,000 people in order to, uh, to prevent uh, the, the Islamists from coming to power. Uh, I think this, this has, uh, that even today in the West, we have heard that the, the French, for example, are looking at the elections in, in Tunisia with suspicion, uh, claiming that they might be threats to human rights from the Islamists coming to power. Uh, at that time, they were not so particular about the threats to human rights of, of the people of Tunisia when they were, uh, when, when they were performed by a secular regime. I, I think uh, threats to human rights are the same if they are from Islamists or from secular regimes. But for some reason, I have uh, said in, 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 a, in a recent uh, uh, article and, and chapter in a book that uh, the West or the, the liberals want to have something like uh, uh, akin to Wilayat al faqih but they call it the, the, the guardianship of the liberals. <laughs> they are not interested in democracy. They are interested in liberalism first. And by the same uh, our logic of, the, uh, of, of Khomeini, uh, they're saying that it's liberalism which rules, and the liberals should be the guardian who determines, regardless of what the people want, how things should go. I mm. don't think that, that that's how things were going to work. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm. All right, listen, uh, Dr. Alfani, I want to come back to you on a later point, but I want to just move on um, to perhaps what you might call the regional politics with in terms of Islamist relation to both the United States and to Israel. Now, um, can I turn to you, um, Oliver? I mean, obviously, I, I mean, Nata said that it will 
change relations um, to, of, the, of the country to, to Israel. Um, how do you see the United States that has propped up these totalitarian leaders for so many years because it suited their uh, strategic interests in the region? Well, how are they going to respond when the policies of these governments might not be to their liking? Yes, I, I don't think it's a question of the policy not to their liking. I think America will feel threatened. Well, breaking relations with Israel won't be to well, their liking. Well, I think they'll be feel, feel threatened more so that because of their own uh, domestic interest, economic interest, oil, all of these things, you know, they had a nice control on these regimes. So now they're going to have to renegotiate the relationships with each country separately. And I think that's a good thing. You know, we're seeing a power shift. We're seeing the, the North African... The weakening of American power, you mean? Yeah, Gordon. North African Arab nations coming into their own right, being actors in their own right, no longer having this neo-colonialism that puts stability over respect for rights and so. But coming to the Israeli question, I honestly think that in Tunisia, in Egypt, in they don't want instability that they will find a way of relating to Israel, but not at the expense of the Palestinians, which the previous regimes did. So Israel will have to renegotiate its relationship with the Palestinian people if it's going to enjoy good relationships. Al Alabasi, do you see that quickly, please? Do you see that as, a, as, 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 a, as positively well, as, as Oliver McTinnon? Yeah, yeah, I think, and I add that any uh, elected government, whether in Egypt or Tunisia, even if it's not Islamist, is going to be very, very careful mm. about relations with Israel. Now, we know that um, Mubarak uh, must always pay lip service to the Palestinians, my, uh, and his dealings with Israel were mainly secret. So even the, the, you know, the, the pro-Western stooge, if I, might, if I might say, must pay lip, lip service not to offend the majority of his people. So whoever comes to power, Islamist or non-Islamist, they will be predominantly pro-Palestinian. Well, OK, but I mean, the question is, how will that affect? And we, we're running out of time, Dr. Uh, El Effendi, very quickly. I mean, how do you see that key question emerging in the coming years? You've got the Arab street having its voice, and that voice will be change policy to Israel. 20 seconds, how, would, how do you see that happening? Well, I think that, that you were right in uh, the, the speaker who said that, um, I think it was McTain, and that Israel has to reevaluate its, uh, uh, its policies because the Arab regimes used to shield Israel and also American interests from, uh, from uh, accountability. Now that has changed. And I okay. think. Dr. Alafendi, I'm sorry to break in there. It's a fascinating discussion. I'm afraid we're coming to a short break. Uh, thank you all um, for joining us. But coming up in the second half, Gaddafi is dead, but what next for Libya? Please stay with us. Welcome back to The World This Week with me, Phil Rees. Well, Libya was formally declared as liberated this week after the killing of Muammar Gaddafi and the defeat of the final remnants of his regime in the city of Sirte. After seven months, over 25,000 NATO bombing sorties and up to 50,000 deaths. The National Transitional Council, or NTC, which led the rebellion against Gaddafi, announced that war is over. Well, the media in the West celebrated with gusto. The Sun newspaper referred to Gaddafi as Mad Dog and showed his bloodied picture under the headline, Mad Dog Put Down. That was after his torture and summary execution. Well, David Cameron glowed after his first successful victory in war. And newspapers such as the Daily Telegraph suggested that Libya's war revealed that Western intervention could once more be a force for good. Well, before we discuss the death of uh, the dictator and other developments in Libya, which will be later in the program, let's consider the role of the West in the Libyan revolution and what that means for the future. Here's Nina Arif. With the Libyan revolution now over and Gaddafi forever gone, NATO countries are expecting some payback for their support, which made the defeat of the old regime possible. Britain's new defence secretary has urged companies to head to the oil-rich country to secure construction contracts. And after an eight-month campaign of aerial bombardment, there's quite a lot to reconstruct. In a BBC interview, UK Defence Secretary Phil Hammond said... Libya is a relatively wealthy country with oil reserves, and I expect there will be opportunities for British and other companies to get involved in the reconstruction of Libya. I would expect British companies, even British sales directors, to be packing their suitcases and looking to get out to Libya and take part in the reconstruction of that country as soon as they can. Libya's National Transitional Council 
has said it will reward countries who supported the rebels' fight against Gaddafi. And so with NATO countries poised to capitalize from the war in Libya, what about the Libyan people? Well, the NTC's UK representative, Juma al Gamati, seen here on this program six months ago, says that contracts will be awarded not on the basis of political favoritism, but on merit, quality and competitiveness. Skeptics and realists, on the other hand, expect that backers of the Libyan revolution will benefit most. As for the governance of Libya, officials in the NTC have signalled a move towards a more Islamic form of rule. While the mention of Islamic or Sharia law will most likely raise eyebrows in the West, the NTC has been quick to reassure its allies that their religious views are moderate. The Libyan revolution was very different to that of Tunisia or Egypt. And as it draws to an end, many will be asking questions like, was the war in Libya really a people's revolution or a NATO business venture? Why was Al Jazeera instructed not to report on NATO's involvement in the immediate aftermath of Gaddafi's death? Will Islamists in Libya influence the new constitution? And how will this go down with the West? Well, to discuss some of the questions raised in Nina's report, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Middle East expert Yossi Meckelberg from Regents College London and Chatham House. We also have the UK Director of Human Rights Watch, David Mepper. And on the phone, we have the founder of Libyan human rights organization, Libya Watch, Mohammed Abdul Malik. Well, thank you all. Well, let me start with you, uh, Yossi Meckelberg, um, politicians and media in the UK appear to be celebrating as if somehow Britain had, had won this war. I mean, is that uh, surprising? Well, politicians have the tendency to move between euphoria and depression from the sublime to the ridiculous. So, yes, I think no one is, is, is sad to see Gaddafi go, but the hard work is starting from now. And the nation building, the rebuilding of, of, of Libya starting here, and the, the, the early days are not that promising. What we need to see is support from the international community, we need support from the Arab world. The Arab world itself is changing and see how they can help Libya actually to reconstruct Libya, to build the institutions that it needs. I don't think we are talking right now about democracy, but we need more representative institution. And, and first and foremost, start with uh, actually respecting human rights. Because, of course, it's, Libya is a very divided country um, in terms of you know, both regionally, I mean, questions of Islamism as well, the extent of that, and indeed the armed groups that, uh, you know, ha have not necessarily gelled now. I mean, how optimistic are you that, you know, it will be a place that the West wants to do business with? Well, of course, the, the West would like to, to, to do business because there is plenty of oil and, and natural gas in, 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 in Libya. But it's not for really to the Western companies to let them just to say, oh, is another place when rerun exactly what happened in the last 70, maybe 100 years in, in the Middle East. Actually, it's the time for government and multinational companies to be more responsible and to do it together with the people of Libya. And if this won't happen, we'll go again and we'll be exactly in the same situation that will support some dictatorship that would emerge, will support them with money and with weapons, and will get something similar, just by name. See what happens right now, for instance, in Syria, or, or in Egypt. When we think that there is change, still we get more of the same. The need is for responsibility, the European Union definitely in the United States, to show responsibility. And yes, let companies to go there to help to reconstruct, but at the same time, for the good of the people, the people of Libya. I mean, David, do you believe, um, you know, representing Human Rights Watch, that global businesses um, take enough account of, of human rights? Um, and um, do you think in, in Libya that uh, that is something that they are concerned about in terms of um, the oil contracts? And mm. as we heard there from the British government's minister saying that a sales director should be packing their bags to go there. Mm. It was a slightly, slightly extraordinary statement to, to move so quickly to be sort of trumpeting the benefits to British business of the change in Libya. I think what, what is required in Libya clearly and in other places is a decent transparent framework for these kinds of things. And if it appears that sort of special favours are being done, to those powers that were most involved in, inter in, in the international intervention, that strikes me as being in inappropriate. On a clear, transparent framework, no, no doubt Libya will require some international investment and it will require some international help in order to assist the process of reconstruction, but that needs to be done openly and transparently. And, and if there's any hint of sort of special favours being done, I think that's a matter of concern. 
Because, in fact, Human Rights Watch, um, whom you represent, and indeed um, Amnesty International, um, have been quite lone voices in terms of the British media, the public discourse, um, in revealing human rights abuses that have been taking place there. Yep. Um, the mainstream media have basically just been taking sides in this and obviously representing perhaps Gaddafi as a man who had himself, of course, a very poor human rights record. But why do you think that is? Well, we've been working in, in Libya for a long time, and we've reported a lot of the abuses that Colonel Gaddafi and his regime was, were responsible for. But our job as an independent uh, international human rights organization is to shine the spotlight on whoever's violating human rights, whether that be the NTC or people that are allied with the NTC or the Gaddafi regime. And we'll do that you know, without fear or favor. If there are abuses that are being committed, it's entirely appropriate and right that they're brought to the public, into the public domain, that action is taken to address them. I mean, 50,000 people have died um perhaps a little bit less, but certainly that's an estimate from the um, NTC. Um, in Yemen, probably a couple of thousand, in, 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 despite what's been going on in Syria, maybe 3,000. Um, I mean, some might say this kind of intervention has just caused a huge bloodbath. I mean, Human Rights Watch doesn't take a position on, on military intervention. That's, that's beyond our mandate. What we are there to do is to ensure that governments and opposition forces respect human rights. And what is absolutely clear and is, is well known is that Gaddafi in his 42 years as the leader of Libya was responsible for some terrible abuses. Everyone in the UK certainly is familiar with the, the blowing up of the airliner over Lockerbie in 1988 in which 270 people lost their lives, the killing of PC Fletcher. But also perhaps less well known is the killing of, of 1,200 people in Abu